spiral signals that organize the work of the brain have been discovered. Scientists have spotted mysterious spiral signals in brain scans. They were present both at rest and working on various tasks. This complex system, scientists believe, seems to organize brain activity. Our brain holds many secrets from us. Scientists constantly find something in its functioning that surprises them and whose meaning is not clear to them at first. The latest such finding is strange vortices in the cerebral cortex, which were observed in people examined using functional magnetic resonance imaging (fMRI). The description and results of the research were published in the journal Nature Human Behavior. The mysterious signals were discovered in a study of 100 adults aged 22 to 35. The goal was to look more closely at the functioning of the cerebral cortex. Because so far much more focus has been placed on the neurological connections existing in the brain. In the context of the above-mentioned signals, no difference was found between resting and performing specific tasks, they were present in both cases. And most importantly, their presence was found in all examined people. These signals have been defined as spinning spirals of brain waves. They arise in the cerebral cortex and naturally arrange themselves into interacting vortices. The cerebral cortex performs many important functions in our brain. It is responsible for our memory, attention, perception, the language we use, and even our consciousness. At the same time, there are a number of diseases that significantly impair the functioning of the cerebral cortex. These include Alzheimer's disease, other types of dementia, and cerebral palsy. At the moment, we do not yet know exactly what the function of the complex system of vortices is, however, based on the difficult analysis of the observed patterns. Scientists believe that they may serve to organize the work of various areas in the brain, and even promote faster information processing. In other words, they can act as bridges between even distant parts of the brain, connecting them into a network. At the same time, they can also pass through the cerebral cortex itself. The activities undertaken by the surveyed people influenced the signals discussed here in an interesting way. In one case, participants dealt with solving math problems. In another they just listened to stories. In the meantime, scientists have observed a change in the direction of movement of the vortices in different areas of the brain from clockwise to counterclockwise. This may lead to the conclusion that the aforementioned coordination of brain activity can be done by changing the rotation. Besides, it was noticed that these signals quite often appear on the border of areas that perform various functions in our brain. The discoverers of the vortices hope that their work will lead to a significant change in the approach to neuroscience research, which will focus more on phenomena occurring in our brain on a larger scale.
Only a combination of processes that take place in it on different scales can give us a full picture of exactly how this extraordinary organ of ours works. By the way, the discovery discussed above may have an interesting side effect. Well, it can be a kind of inspiration for advanced computers that try to imitate the extremely complicated processes taking place in the human brain. Humans have the biological toolkit needed to produce venom. Geneticists have identified a common trait between humans and snakes. Mammals and reptiles share a similar set of genes. Responsible for activity in the tissues that produce saliva and venom. The discovery provides the first direct evidence that venom glands evolved from early salivary glands. Humans, like mice, are not poisonous, but our genomes have the potential to do so, say researchers at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, OIST, and the Australian National University. Their research shows that humans have the biological toolkit needed to produce venom. The scientists shared their findings in the journal PNAS. Venom is a cocktail of proteins that animals use to immobilize and kill prey, as well as for self-defense. It's interesting that venom is found in so many different animals, jellyfish, spiders, scorpions, snakes and even some mammals, says lead author Agnish Barua of the OIST. Evolution has made the methods of delivering venom very different from each other. However, the system that uses the oral cavity, from where the venom is injected through the bite, is one of the most common, emphasizes the scientist. Recent research on snakes, well-known venom predators, reveals the genetic basis for this mechanism. So far, scientists have focused on the genes that are responsible for the production of proteins that create a toxic mix. However, many of the toxins found in animal venom came about after the system of injecting venom into victims was established. We wanted to look at the genomes that were present before the venom. The genomes that made the venom systems possible, says Barua. The researchers used the venom glands of the Taiwanese habu snake, Trimerosaurus flavoviridis, found in Asia. The team looked for genes that interact with those responsible for the composition of the venom. Researchers have identified around 3,000 similar, cooperating, genes. They found that they play an important role in protecting cells from the effects of high protein production. These genes were also crucial in modifying protein composition. In order to make a protein, the long chains of amino acids must assemble in a specific way, otherwise they will not function properly. Misfolded proteins can accumulate and damage cells. That is why the role of cooperating genes seems so important. Venoms are complex mixtures of proteins in order to be able to produce them efficiently.
You need a robust system to ensure that they are assembled correctly, explains Barua. The researchers then looked at the genomes of other creatures from across the animal kingdom, including mammals such as dogs, chimpanzees and humans. It turned out that they have their own versions of similar genes. When the team looked at mammalian salivary gland tissues, they found that the genes had a similar pattern of activity to that seen in snake venom glands. So scientists believe that salivary glands in mammals and venom glands in snakes share an ancient core of DNA dating back to when the two lineages diverged. Many scientists intuitively felt that this could be the case. But now we have the first real evidence to support the theory that venom glands evolved from early salivary glands, says Barua. The apparent ease with which the function of the salivary glands can be used to produce venom is surprising. Scientists are beginning to view other mammals in a disturbing new light. Perhaps in a few hundred years mice will evolve to produce toxic venom. Some studies from previous years seem to confirm the validity of similar concerns. And although it is highly unlikely, if the right ecological conditions ever existed, humans could also become poisonous. It definitely gives a whole new meaning to the term, toxic person, Barua jokes. Why does the brain use so much energy? Scientists know the answer. New research explains why our most important organ, although it weighs about 2% of the human body weight, it consumes about 20% of all his energy. All probably because the brain was constantly ready for action. The brain is considered to be a very energy-intensive organ, says the author of the study. Professor Timothy Ryan, a biochemist at Vile Cornell Medicine in New York. Previously, Scientists assumed that such a large intake was associated with the fact of electrical activity in the brain. The constant firing of electrical signals by cells leads to the use of huge amounts of energy stored in molecules called adenosine 5-triphosphates (ATP). However, Research conducted over the past decades has identified an unexplained gap in this theory. It turns out that the brains of people in a vegetative or comatose state, which show very little electrical activity, still use huge amounts of energy. So the neuroscientists were faced with the question, if electrical activity doesn't use up all the energy in the brain, then what does? In a new study, researchers have discovered that tiny structures in our brains called synaptic vesicles that store and transport neurotransmitters can constantly draw energy. This happens regardless of whether they are needed or not. Perhaps this situation causes the brain to be constantly ready for action. The new study was published in the journal Science Advances. In recent years, Ryan and his team have been studying connections in the brain called synapses. 
They allow neurons to meet and communicate by releasing tiny bubbles filled with chemicals called neurotransmitters. Previously, scientists had shown that active synapses use a lot of energy. The new study disabled neurons with a toxin and then measured ATP levels inside the synapses. It turned out that the connections between neurons still use a lot of energy. Researchers decided to find out why this was happening and took a closer look at synaptic vesicles. It turned out that various particles responsible for transporting energy to and from synapses worked round the clock, even when neurons were deactivated and the synapses themselves rested. In other words, energy leaks from the vesicles responsible for the transport of chemical compounds even in inactive synapses. The researchers said that the leakage is caused by so-called transport proteins that pick up the neurotransmitter, change its shape and transfer it to the inside of the vesicle. This is due to the difference in the concentrations of substances inside the protein. Energy is needed to perform this task, and this process happens constantly. Whether the neurons remain active or not, we found some kind of inefficiency in the neurons, explains Ryan. A leak may seem small, but if you put trillions of leaks together, you end up spending quite a bit of energy, even without electrical activity. The research was conducted using rat neurons, but according to the researchers, a similar mechanism is very likely in humans. It is not clear why our brains evolved this way. Perhaps thanks to this mechanism, our brain is able to activate the necessary neurons faster. Ryan and his team hope their findings will help not only understand how the human brain works, but also help people with the disease. For example, the discovery could lead to the development of new therapies for certain diseases, such as Parkinson's disease. A gene therapy gel offers hope for a cure for a rare skin disease. Scientists have managed to correct an extremely rare disease, the characteristic feature of which is that the skin, even under the slightest pressure, forms painful blisters. Bullous detachment of the epidermis, as the disease is technically called, was inhibited by gene therapy applied to the skin with a gel. This work, the experts point out, is a major step forward in the growing field of gene therapy research. Epidermolysis bullosa is an inherited disease that makes the skin so sensitive that it can tear even when touched. Any mechanical trauma, pressure on the skin, even that caused by clothing, causes blisters to appear on the skin 
which then form wounds that are difficult to heal. Discoloration, scarring, skin defects or erosions also appear in the disease. Wounds also make patients susceptible to infection, and the disease itself promotes the development of skin cancers. In severe cases, the wounds may cover most of the body. This makes daily activities impossible to perform. While some mild forms of the disease may improve with age, there is no cure for severe cases, which can ultimately be fatal. There are several experimental treatments, such as stem cell therapies. However, these have only proven effective for some patients. In addition, this invasive technique requires a skin graft, which is expensive and requires hospitalization. But scientists at Stanford University have now developed a cheaper and easier solution that may bring much needed relief to those affected by the disease. The research results were published in the journal Nature Medicine. In a study of a small group of patients, researchers used a gel containing DNA to help repair the skin. This approach is just one of several new experimental gene therapies for the condition but it is by far the simplest. A gel filled with viruses carrying the appropriate genes is spread on the skin like an ointment. There is no need for any costly treatments or hospitalization. The gel's makers say it's the first topical gene therapy to undergo clinical trials and is probably the most effective such therapy developed to date. Nine people, including three children, participated in the study. They all had the dystrophic form of the disease, RDEB, which means their cells lack the genetic instructions to build a protein called collagen 7. Normally, this collagen would bind several layers of skin together, thus preventing painful blisters and wounds that may remain unhealed for months or even years. A team led by dermatologist Peter Marinkovich of Stanford University School of Medicine developed a gel containing herpes simplex viruses 1. Of course. The viruses were modified so that they could not replicate and contained the collagen 7 gene. One of the advantages of herpes viruses is that their genome is large enough for the large collagen 7 gene. Another is that the virus evolved to avoid triggering a response from the human immune system. This is the reason why most herpes infections persist, which is embarrassing for those infected. But as a gene therapy vector it can be quite beneficial. Gel viruses have two intact copies of a gene called COL7A1. Previous attempts to use this gene in skin grafts have been shown to be safe and help heal wounds, but engineering and growing the grafts was laborious and expensive. They also required anesthesia and a week's hospitalization to monitor the progress of therapy. In contrast, 
The gel used in the new study was applied topically during short weekly outpatient visits where dressings were changed. The herpes simplex virus in the gel does not integrate into the host genome when it infects a cell. This is an advantage as there is a small risk that integration may disrupt normal gene expression. In addition, the developed gel is stable at room temperature and can be applied without specialist knowledge during routine dressing changes. The researchers treated two wounds on each patient. Applying a gel to one wound and a placebo to the other every second or third day. This therapy lasted for 25 days. After three months, they assessed the condition of the wounds to determine how well they had healed. Most wounds treated with gene therapy gel closed within three months of treatment. The exception was a foot wound that one of the participants had had for five years. It eventually healed after the second course of treatment and remained confined for an eight-month period while the patient was monitored. In another case, a large 10-year-old wound covering most of a patient's side healed about 70% during treatment, but this patient's smaller wounds healed completely during treatment. In comparison, wounds treated with placebo gel sometimes healed but reopened. Not every wound treated with the new gel has completely healed, but the results are pretty good, said Marinkovic. The study is the first to show that gene therapy vectors for skin diseases can be effective when applied topically. This is also the first trial of gene therapy in children with epidermolysis bullosa. The wounds heal quickly, but more importantly, they stay closed, said Dr. Marinkovic. The therapy strengthens the skin and breaks the painful and destructive cycle of opening and closing wounds that patients with epidermolysis bullosa experience, he added. Moreover, Samples of the treated skin taken from the seven study patients showed that they were producing collagen 7 as early as 9 days after the start of treatment. In at least one case, collagen 7 expression persisted for almost 100 days. Study participants experienced a few adverse events, but they were mild. We haven't seen any serious problems with repeated administration of the gel, and patients and their families have been very enthusiastic about the results, said Marinkovic. If the gel is approved for clinical use by the Food and Drug Administration, we will be able to reach many more patients with this devastating disease. The viral vector does not penetrate deep into the skin, so it cannot completely prevent blistering. And because collagen 7 degrades and the treated skin cells eventually exfoliate, the gel needs to be reapplied periodically. It's not a permanent cure, but it's a way to really keep wounds under control. It significantly improves the quality of life of patients, emphasized Marinkovich.